Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we look at a bit of cable integration on some bikes. Uh, Sam Hill's got a very new bike, which is quite interesting. We'll very take a shiny. look at that as well. Uh, and we've got a real cool little retro rewind section too. Okay, so first up in the news, we're going to talk a little bit about hidden cables in a cockpit because this mm. is starting to be a thing. Yep. Uh, I think we're going to see it a lot. So Magura have been showing off this uh, integrated cockpit. Um, this is it on the screen now. What do you make of this thing, Henry? Yeah, it's quite a amazing piece of kit. All the actual brake internals go into the handlebar. Yeah. For me, <laughs> you know, just I think it looks really nice. Yeah. However, that front cable coming doing a weird loop the loop in their photos i don't think showcases how neat it could be yeah. personally having a front hose would be absolutely fine to me completely external i don't really like it going down but through the steerage tube sort of thing yeah well, i think it looks really nice i think for people that maybe just set and forget because once your hoses are inside you're probably less likely to damage them so then the possibility of having to swap them over is less but i imagine how heartbreaking it would be with say, you know, the SRAM or Shimano hoses, you can't, you have to start with the, the end is crimped. Yeah, for sure, yeah. So, yeah, you yeah. know, imagine something oh, going wrong with a hose. Be a it would just be. And oh, at the same sad. time though, our roadie friends have done this for quite some time. They have, yeah. And if you look back at old road bikes with the bloody cables going everywhere, it's it awful. Absolutely And you kind terrible. of forget, and they look mm -hmm. so neat that you actually forgot it was one way. So I can, I can imagine it at some point being yeah. staple on yeah. high end mountain bikes. And it seems to be such a trend because like, so we've got this Magura system, which is, you know, very smart. There's that trick stuff system a little while back, yeah, yeah. which I think actually might be arguably the easier because I worry with this Magura system, how many options in terms of handlebar. And also if you wanted to just cut your handlebars down, I don't know the ins and outs, the technical drawings, if that would be a bit of a nuisance. Having to change your brake yeah. position, more inboard. So I saw a prototype of this a couple of years ago, Eurobike, and obviously being a prototype, it was quite clunky, but you could see the concept. And mm -hmm. I've got to say, I was blown away by it. Mm. I mean, at the time, the one I saw was actually for like urban commuter type bikes. Oh yes, yeah. But it looked so flush and it actually had light integrated to the stem and cool. there's a whole bunch of other things going on there. Yeah. Um, I definitely think it is going to be part of the future though. I think it is, you, yeah. you look at what SRAM are doing with the access system, binning off the cables there, and even running just the SRAM access system, you drop a post to right on one side, mm -hmm. um, and you've just got the two hoses from your brakes. That looks so tidy yeah. already. So if you're getting rid of those, and what, gosh, it'd be amazing. And what I really like about that access system is you can tune the buttons to do whatever you want. Yeah. And so you send one wide, some yeah, wide up, and down. up and down dropper. Yeah. So clean, so nice. Um, it leads us nicely on to Sam Hill has gone to on a prototype nuke proof. Oh, and this looks so good it as well. It looks yeah. so good. Um, but he's actually, people are saying it's the first ever EWS racer to be running AXS, but I've got a feeling that's not true. But certainly it's a big switch for such a, a big name. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's funny, hey, how people- so He's used the post for a while, hasn't he? Yes, he has, We've yeah. seen him using a regular derailleur. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting change. But do you not think around, in the conversation around electronics on our bikes, there's somewhat, some kind, some kind of selective outrage. People say, oh my God, it's not reliable. We're having never used it. You never hear them complain about how unreliable laptops are or the starter motor on their car. Yeah, for sure. Why is electric inherently unreliable? People don't like change. They don't like change. I don't like change. No one, did, no one likes change, do they? Takes you a while to fix it, you know? I'm cables always habit. worked. Cables, uh, cables stretch, cables break. You know, there's, yeah. there's problems both ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, all I can see from someone like Sam Hill's point of view is how good it would be, you know, you break a mech, it's a fast thing, bolt another one straight on mm -hmm. and get going. Yeah. Um, purely from a race point of view, it's got to be an advantage. And if someone said to you today, you're going to get given a bike yeah. that's that internally rooted completely, yeah. with wireless as much as, well, to the nth degree, would you have any negative feelings about that? Um, no, to be honest, um, well, actually no, I'll take that back, yeah, I would. Um, Ooh. So my my Get the old new, switcher yeah, really there, Dodster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just thinking because internal routing works fantastic on some bikes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always work out well. It'd have to be one that's got decent routing with decent uh, sort of in and out mm -hmm. out ports because some are a pain in the ass. You can't deny that. I think yes. everyone everyone out there that's got internal routing will have had some sort of issue at some point with that dreaded it doesn't come out the other end. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of why I like my current Nuke Proof Mega. 
It's all external. It's all external. Change of brake in like five minutes, done. Yeah. See, Back I, in the trails, no bleeding, no pulling anything apart. I love internal routing. I, I love the way it looks. But that being said, internal routing, there are some road systems where to drop the stem, even if you only want to experiment with it, you have to remove, say drop the stem five mil, you've got to yeah. remove five mil of hose to get it low enough because it's such a tight tolerance. Yeah, that's, So that that's, extent, I think even for, as a rider going from different locations, if it's steep, you know, you want change of handlebar height. Yeah. And it could be just bloody annoying, you know? I, I completely agree. Yeah, um, what do you guys think of yeah. internal routing for shifting and for brakes? Um, let us know. Do you like them? Do you hate them? Do you wish you had them? Are they too noisy? Do they look ugly with the cables on the outside? Whatever it is, internal routing, get a hashtag going down there. Let us know in those comments. And there's also that new bike, which is another, unbelievably, another long travel 29er. Oh, Can you believe yeah. it? Didn't see that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Arc 8 Extra. Which is something special, I think. It is. It's kind of it's a bit reminiscent of like a Pagani Zonda, that sort of hyperbike yeah, kind of, territory. Do you know what I mean? It sort of ridiculous. Me a little bit of somewhere between Scott and Bold as well. Yes. You know, yeah. some similar sort of design ethos going on there. Um, even at a glance, it looks a little bit like the older Scott Genius, I think. And it's interesting, you, you know, when you think of uh, Switzerland and engineering, yeah. you think of reliability, but not necessarily extravagant. But yeah. A lot of bikes do, bike companies out of Switzerland do things quite extravagantly. Yeah. Yeah, bold, completely yeah. left of centre. Yeah, that's the ones with the hidden shocks, of course. Yeah, this thing out of Switzerland and it looks pretty cool and the cables go through the headset yeah so that's really neat and it, it does really look at the silhouette of this bike it's on screen right now lovely slender top tube on there as well the whole yeah. thing looks kind of right it looks like it sits on the trail nicely and i think you were telling me about the weight of it yeah so um they're quoting a size medium i think it is uh 2300 grams to the frame and i read that so wow. like, oh, that's that quite, really light yeah, it's quite um, light so it's like a 160 mil bike so the scott genius was uh 2250 but that's a 150 mm -hmm. And then the Ransom is more like 2650 for the same equivalent oh, wow. size and yeah. travel. So this thing is really quite light for, for what it is. Okay, so what else we got? Oh, good stuff, Wildhaber, yeah. So he's yeah. got that new cube. Um, this is it, actually spotted on his Instagram. It's been floating around actually on various pages I've seen this. Um, slightly upped in travel as well. Yes. Is it 170 now? Yeah, huge That's rear a motor vehicle. Big travel. bike, yeah, 29 yeah. wheel bike with 170 mil travel. Um, I mean, he's like a mountain goat, this guy, so yeah. it's going to be no trouble for him winching up the hill. But I'm be I believe he actually bagged it at the e uh, top 10 EWS. I think yeah. he got 10th. Amazing. So off to a good start. Yeah, it's proven already. It looks like alloy underneath there. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of... Kind of figures with Cube, the way they do things. Yes. But it looks, looks great. And how Cube have changed over the years. They have. I remember an early Cube that I rode that looked amazing. Um, didn't, didn't feel that good to be honest. Yeah. It was amazing value for money. It looked really cool, the silhouette, but the suspension wasn't the best. Mm -hmm. um, and now by all accounts, they're very good. Yeah, I think they they were they were so progressive in some ways in terms of very lightweight, and you could mm -hmm. maybe five years ago get quite a long travel bike that was very light, but they were often quite short. That was my memory of them. Yes, yeah. Um, but I, yeah, they're stereo back in the day, maybe even 2010, yeah, and 2011. Yeah, the Fritz as well. It was actually a bloody good, good bike. bike. Yeah. yeah, really, yeah. really cool bikes. Yeah, great value for money as well, so well worth keeping on what Cube are doing. Okay, now it's time to go into the bike cave. Of course, bike cave is where you keep your bikes, where you lock them up at night, where you uh, talk dirty to your bikes perhaps, Heavens. you keep them clean, any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you've got a great bike cave or even a terrible one, whatever it is, we love seeing them. So make sure you send them in, we really do. So uh, tell us all about them, use the uploader, the links at the bottom of the screen there and we'll check them out and put them on the show. Uh, so first up this week is from George in Eastern Mid London. Just finished building my Blue Pig, so that's a Ragley. I've actually got an old Ragley, my yeah, commuter that's hack. A, yeah, it's a pretty nice good yeah. commuter go. I'll show you it one day. So it's, <laughs> it's actually, I'm quite embarrassed. It's actually a commuter bike now. It's far too nice for that. Um, so it was my first mountain bike since riding a Doors in the 1980s. Wow. Um, Neil should check it out. Um, check out the dirt track up on the first floor. Uh, got a mini ramp oh, in here for rainy days. Nice. nice. Check this out. So a couple cool. of hacks too. Oh, um, yeah. Built the Ragley due to inspiration from watching GMBN and seeing you guys spending so much time having fun in the forests. And you've got your makeshift dirt track as well. Awesome. Look at that mini ramp. That is so cool. I'd love to have a bit of space to do I mean, we probably could do that in Peter's workshop. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure we'd be too happy coming in on a Monday morning to fix a road bike and 
It's a very, it's a very cool place. It, I'm pretty sure you must rent this out for like film, like nightclub scenes and movies and stuff like that. Or, yeah, got a Happy Mondays artwork yeah. on the wall there. You sound, you sound like a cool guy, George. Can, yeah, totally. can you teach me how? <laughs> uh, good use of old retro brake levers there oh, as yeah. well to hang the mugs on. Yeah, that's, that's uh, nice. In fact, we're borrowing that one. Yeah, no, uh, that's but cool. we'll, we won't use road bike brake levers. Um, I said about road bikes are better. Look at all those dirt bikes. Oh, Whoa. God. You've got all sorts of cool stuff in here. So oh, cool. look, Muddy Fox Roadrunner from late 80s. Because Muddy Fox were huge, eh? What happened to them? Muddy Fox were decent to start with, and then at some point they just crashed and oh. they got bought out by. Um, it's almost like an Star sort of Wars type yeah. thing. Yeah, it's a similar story. Kind of happened to Saracen because they were huge back in the day, yeah. massive UK brand. Um, and then the second incarnation was wasn't their best. And now, mm. thankfully, Madison have revived back them properly. Yeah. yeah, and they're making amazing stuff again. And the Muddy Fox, I think we've seen the back of them pretty much. But that's about that. Look at those two Yamahas and little Honda at the back there. Blake would love them. Man, yeah, that's super too. cool. Yeah, and there's your Ragley in the stand. Classic Ragley looking shape. Right, cool. Thank you for yeah, that. So nice, rad, man. Next up's from Teddy. Um, thanks for a brilliant show. Keep them coming. Here's some pictures from my bike cave, some of my bikes, and also the girlfriend's. I built the bike cave from scrap materials and secondhand offers with quirky solutions. It doesn't look much, but it has all the magic, and all the magic happens. It doesn't nice. have to be much. Though. That's the whole point, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I love this life behind bars thing. It's like yeah, kind no, of that's a skull cool. on the wall. <laughs> yeah. I'm not bossy. I just have better ideas. Yeah, that's kind of like Steve Jones. He's a oh, bit like that, isn't he? Oh my goodness. That's a neat Look looking little area. So you've got your mallet and your hammers up top there. You've got all sorts of crimps and things going on. Nice Look at the greases. Like with the, yes, those paintbrushes, the syringes. Yeah. That's actually... Hydraulic oils. Bloody nice. <laughs> oh, hello. Seen the rest of it now. My word. Yeah, looking good. Well kitted out in there. Got a yeah. bench grinder there around the side. How it is. What's going on down the back here? Fitting moto tyres, perhaps? Yeah. Nice. Really, that is some solid work. Teddy. Such a selection of hammers, yeah. bit of a percussive maintenance potentially happening there. Yeah, cool, and a good bike selection too. So you've got Remedy, you've got Stevens up the top there. Um, what is that? Is that a high bike x Duro with a set of Dorados on it? I believe it's actually the, the Doritos. Oh, sorry, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I guess that's your wife's x Duro as well. Rad. Yeah, super cool. Wicked setup. Nice. Well, there you go. So uh, out of the bike cave for this week, please continue to send yours in, um, especially if you've got like a huge, ridiculously cool one or a tiny one, maybe in the back of a van or a little shed. Anything is welcome. And that's time for Rewind, which is uh, us basically talking about old retro bike stuff. Um, I'm not going to bore you too long this week. In fact, I lied. Here's a little clip from the museum in Marin County. If you guys want to see all this stuff properly, you're going to have to come here yourself and see it. But check this out. For some of the early 19th century bikes to start with, obviously the penny farthing. Like, can you imagine even riding one of these things? As we found out earlier on, you know, trying to break on one of these things, you're going to go straight over the bar. So I have to step off the back of the bike onto the peg there. Just insane. And of course, that moved on to like tricycles, which doesn't really look like a tricycle that we would know from, from our day. And then onto the safety bicycle, which doesn't look very safe to me, I've got to say. But the reason it was called a safety bicycle, it had two wheels so you couldn't pitch yourself over the front. Look at this chain on this thing. This is absolutely nuts, the technology that's in it. And the solid rubber tyres as well before pneumatic tyres came in here, thanks to Dunlop, of course. And it's just like, it's amazing. Look at the brakes, the way the brakes work on there. Simple system, got a safety light on the front, and it's got, like boats would have port and starboard lights on them, it's got red on the right, and it's got green on the left, so you know which way the bikes come forwards, even though there's a light on the front, so you arguably don't need to know that. But more importantly, that stuff's cool, but that all led to why we're really here. And this is really where it all started for us, the early clunkers. So clunkers is a generic sort of American term thrown to like old rat cars, bikes, anything in particular that sort of doesn't really assemble anything. And of course, they used to be sort of like 50s paperboy bikes and beach bikes. As you can see, there's one here. This is one of these very early bikes, a ballooner type bike. And this is what they ended up on when they weren't riding their road bikes originally. And then of course, after a while, they'd end up looking like this, where they took off anything that would rattle loose, basically, put slightly chunkier tires on them. And suddenly this sort of rat bike they've got for around town became something of a bit more purpose. And after a while, they started developing them and working out they could go flying down mountain paths on these things. And they started developing into mountain bikes. You can see this one here, it's got a tandem hub on there with a rear derailleur. And then this particular one here, 
was credited as being one of the first sort of real starts of where mountain biking began. But the most famous bike, arguably, has to be the Breezer number one. That was actually the number two, technically, because the number one, which was commissioned by Charlie to Joe Breeze to actually build it, the number one bike actually went, Joe Breeze kept that himself so he could refine that bike before giving one to, to Charlie Kelly, of course. And if you look at the difference between that and the later models of the modified cruisers, so the cruisers have got the brakes on there that count, they've got the knobbly tyres, all the stuff you'd expect to need to ride a bike off-road, but really the frames weren't up to the duty. Look at these straight, strong tubing. Even a head angle on this thing, it's like a 67 and a half degree head angle. That's pretty normal by today's standards. Fairly long chain stays on there, adjustable chain stay length. All the sort of stuff that you want to see on a modern mountain bike today, a fairly short stem, big handlebars for control. It was all there at the very beginning. And then moving on from the Breezer, of course, became the original mountain bike, the first mountain bike. This is it, made by Tom Ritchie. And it was kind of designed in conjunction with Charlie Kelly and Gary Fisher. This later became the Fisher mountain bike as we know it today. And of course, the rest as we know is history. Mountain biking for me was a little bit different because I first started reading the magazines in late 89. I didn't really get a proper mountain bike, probably until about 91. It was all hobbled together stuff. But this was the kind of tech that was coming out at the time, the Kestrel. That's like one of the first carbon bikes, actually. Pretty amazing looking thing, but you look at the fork on it, you look at a lot of the other stuff on it. It's a bit strange, to be honest. And these are the Mantis bikes designed by Richard Cunningham with a bolt-on rear end using steel and aluminium construction. Of course, the only way you can make the two together is by bolting them together. And this. The Mountain Cycle San Andreas with the suspender upside down, inverted fork design. This was so far ahead of its time, it's just insane. It's got pro stop disc brakes on it, so it had floating discs. The calipers themselves were hydraulic, but they were cable operated. Leagues ahead of its time. Look at it, it looks kind of modern, even by today's standards. Oh, and just up the top there, the Gary Fisher RS1 there. So that was a four bar rear suspension system designed by Mert Larwell. It's got the leading link fork on there, which kind of came from motorbike technology with a trailing link. And then this is a Yeti Arc ridden by Jimmy Deaton at the famous Kamikaze downhill. Look at the size of the chaming on it. That thing's like a 66 tooth chaming. When do you ever need a chaming that big? What do you use? I've got a 34 on my bike. 66, it's insane. Of course, this is a Foes Racing. So this is, I think, called the LTS. Back in the day, had six inch travel out back. RockShox Mag 21 up front with probably about two inch travel. That looks like to be a pre-production one with an alloy stanchion rather than the steel one, which we saw in later bikes. Carbon head aero rims there. Pretty nice to see that. Of course, Trek OCLV. That was a bit of a questionable bike with the unified rear triangle on that. Up the top there, the Ritchie. Amazing looking. And the stem on that, I'm just gonna show you another bike that's got that same stem on in a second. GT with a classic triple triangle, which is Julie Furtado's Zazang. So it's titanium, this particular one, but the frame design made famous, largely by Hans Ray, to be honest, on the Zaska, which is one of the trials frames. Up the top there is the Ibis bow tie. That is effectively a pivotless version of a unified design. The whole frame bends in the middle there. Pretty cool, pretty, pretty rowdy. And then, of course, the Cannondale Fulcrum on the end there. But I just want to draw you to two particular bikes I want to talk about. One of them is just Above your head here, I'm not sure if you can see this, this is from Hans Ray. This is a modified trials bike, a 20 inch wheel, designed to get up over anything basically. And Hans is large, you could largely say that he made mountain biking extreme in the first place because he took that sort of style of riding onto 26 inch wheels when he realised that they were going to be the, the most popular form of cycling to be done basically. And then one last little baby to look at is I often talk about the, the Gervin Flex stem. This was another iteration out. This is the Allsop soft ride stem. So you can have the advantages of suspension with a suspension stem and not a suspension fork. Um, I don't know how well that rode, but I can tell you how badly the Gervin Flex stem rode. But interestingly, you've got the Allsop soft ride beam technology on here. It's a carbon beam joined at the frame and relied on the flex of the actual beam itself. In mountain biking, they weren't that popular. There was only a few frame designs that had them. In the time trial and triathlon world, they've become quite popular because they took out a lot of that road buzz that it had. But it's just interesting to see because there's so much design that happens in mountain biking in such a short space of time compared to a lot of other sports because you're able to borrow technology from so many different aspects like motocross, motorsports, road cycling. That's why arguably, in my mind, mountain biking is the best thing in the world. Okay, so now it's time for top mods, which is where we look at you work, the work you've done on your bike, some 
often quite creative solutions. Quite diplomatic, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> so it can be anything from bikes you've jigged up yourselves, frame builds, or just the smaller jobs that you feel, you know, done with a bit of pride. Yeah. So get them in, you know, don't be shy. We have the uploader link below. And um, yeah, we love seeing them. So, so please do get them in. Cool, right, straight in. So first up uh, is from Francois in France. Um, it used to have a giant rain from 2013. And it's completely rebuilt it over the years, um, thanks to the channel, which is cool. Yeah, so yeah, nice cool. one. Um, thanks for watching the stuff, happy to help. Um, I've changed now to 29, so I wanted to try big wheels with new school geometry. I've got to say it's a blast. So you've got a YT Jeffsy 2019, literally mm. brand new. Um, that's a smoking looking bike, it's yes, really they good. Are really tidy. Eh? Um, of course, because I'm a tech guy, I only ride with parts I've chosen myself. Parts are easy for me to maintain the service. Smart man. Uh, Shimano XT M8000 brakes from my old bike. Being a light rider, two pistons is enough for me. Uh, Shimano, because I prefer mineral oil and they're easy to bleed. Uh, thanks to Henry, I've completely cleaned them and the pistons, and they act like brand new brakes. Huh. So many thanks. Huh. My pleasure. Work. Yeah. Uh, one up bar and stem. I love putting the EDC tool on the fork, uh, but without having to modify it. Uh, SRAM X01 dub crankset, bought it second hand for 170 euros with a 32 X Sync 2 chainring. Um, saved himself a bit of cash there. Yeah, a bit of wheeler dealing, nice. Yeah, nice, okay. So the bike looks really nice as mm. well, a nice bit of colour coordination going on. Uh, so you've got the HT pedals on there as well. Um, quite a fan actually, I've seen quite a few friends running those. Yeah, they're good. very light. Yeah, very, very, very light. The bike yoke dropper, uh, bike yoke dropper as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, they're decent, easily rebuildable, and they don't have the problems with the old spongy air swap issue. Got right. a little bleed valve on them. Yes, yes, so of course. Sim they similar do, yeah. fact to what Rockshox now has. On, yep. On theirs, it's a different take, similar system. Bloody tidy looking bike though, that hey. Yeah, really, really nice. You know, I think, and he's, he's also. He did this before your video on smartening up the cockpit. Oh, actually. No. oh he's done a good job of it. Yeah. Yeah, looking good. Super tidy. Nice stuff. Thank you very much, really Francois. Nice, nice. Right, next up is from Gary. So this is a 2018 Diamondback Catch. Um, I bought this Catch as a good bike, um, good bang for the buck. Couldn't be happier. Over the course of the few weeks, I slowly set the bike up, which included tuning and shifting, adjusting brakes, adjusting the cockpit, setting up the suspension, tubeless conversion, uh, adding extras like frame protection and a bash guard. Frame protection tape is from Miles Wide Industries. And the bash guard is 3D printed and comes from Team CBF. It's my first time using hydraulic brakes and having full suspension. Wow, I yeah. can feel the difference. <laughs> I'm not surprised. By the way, I'm 43 and hail from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, USA. Keep up the great work. Um, nice. Thanks for watching, Gary. Um, all the way over from Pennsylvania. And it's cool to see a project. Yeah, and the silhouette of that Diamondback. I've got to admit, I don't know the Diamondback range that intimately. I feel where you're going with this already. But it's very similar, that VPP of Santa Cruz. It is. Yeah. Very similar, and it's a fantastic system. Um, I, wonder if they, I wonder if they just licensed it out, or are there any, you know, kind of engineering differences? But no, it looks really good. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely bang on there. But there's also, I mean, a lot of similarities to VP3, but also that top line there, also a little bit similar to Mintproof. Like on a link. Yeah, Share, yeah. Shares with it. Quite a tidy bike. Um, questionable uh, work stand. Set up there. Yeah. Um, I hope you're being kind to down to you there, <laughs> Gary, because uh, you know you could accidentally damage your bike there quite easily. But I guess it, make, it makes do. It works. Yeah. Needs must and all that. In the uh, bike shop we, I used to work at in New Zealand, um, being in Queenstown, Kenny McGarry was just a local. He was pretty sponsored in the shop and yeah. he always had his bike in. And they've got his. the one that he did the backflip on. Oh, nice. Um, over the, over yeah. the massive chasm. Yeah. Just, yeah. It does look really cool. And loads of little bits and stuff like that. And no, he was, just, he was such a dude. He was such a gentle giant. Oh, yeah, he was yeah, awesome. Yeah, the absolute boy. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about him later on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up is from uh, Patrick Adams. Uh, it's a GT sanction expert. He's from Saudi Arabia. This oh, is wow. cool. Um, check out my chainstay protection. Tennis racket grip tape. Lightweight and with matching colour to my bike. That's a great shout. It's quite rubbery stuff, yeah, actually. Yeah. But it's really good for dampening sound. Yeah. Um, and obviously it matches your colour of your bike, bro. Perfectly. Uh, I guess you have to keep your chain cleaner to stop it getting all gunky, but probably not an issue if you're riding in, I say, yeah. in Saudi Arabia. Probably a lick of WD-40 and yeah, it's for a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's a nice little hack. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And a few people could borrow that one for some colour coordination. Uh, thank you, Patrick. That's awesome. Um, and as always, everyone, thanks for sending your entries in. Okay, now it's time for Tech of the Week. And actually, this is a really cool one. Um, Henry paid a trip to the guys over at Mojo Rising. 
Today for Tech of the Week, we have something a little bit different. We're here at Mojo Rising and taking a peek at some of the great tech they have on offer. So we're gonna look at fork offset, which is a hot trend at the moment in terms of bike, bike design. Well, firstly, what is it? Fork offset is the measurement of how far your front axle sits in front of your steering axis. Now, the bigger this number is, the more slow and steady your handling will be. And the smaller this number is, the faster and more responsive your handling will be. But like everything, it is a trade-off, it's a compromise. This idea has been visited before, most notably by Gary Fisher, but Mojo at the forefront of this new wave of ideology on fork offset. Now, is it time that what were potentially quite arbitrary numbers were forced to pull up their socks, tuck in their shirt, and check into the new school? Bike design has changed enormously over the last couple of years. Maybe it's time our fork offsets caught up. Experimenting with offsets is a luxury few of us can afford, literally. Experimenting with something like this can be very expensive. There are many different sizes and you might put it on your bike and find that you immediately don't like it or it's not to your taste. Well, this is where the Mork comes in, the Mojo Offset Reduction System. And it's actually adjustable via this flip chip at the bottom to tune into your preferences. Maybe that's gonna be something that you set and forget, or if you've got the sensitivity, you change it on track to track. Now this is actually a prototype and it is very interesting. One of the reasons so is these are actually 36 millimeter in diameter, but I'm gonna get back to that later. We were invited to see their facility where they get all this stuff machined up. And we were about to pencil another day in the diary when they pointed out it was about 25 meters away. So we actually went out and checked it out. We got, even got to see some of these steerers getting the magic treatment. In the footage now we have a custom offset crown for what is actually a formula downhill fork. These crowns are actually made for a slightly heavier rider who wants to run what would normally be considered a downhill setup on his trail bike. But why not take that relatively small when compared to body weight plus bike weight penalty for something that could not only be significantly stiffer, but also give more offset options? Maybe this isn't for your 60 kilogram rider, but for your heavier riders, where that weight penalty will be a smaller proportion of their total weight when combined with the bike. I think it's a really interesting avenue to explore. Now, rumor has it, somebody is making some 36 diameter fork legs to go with this dual crown, bringing the option to run an incredibly stiff performance front end on what would probably be a very hard hitting enduro bike. The other thing I spotted here was this weight that sits above your steerer. Now, why would you want to go and add more weight to your bikes? Well, this applies preload to the bike, even when you're not weighting the front end through your hands. So if you hit a bump, instead of it pushing up the suspension, which in turn pushes up your front end, it actually gives something for the suspension to work against, so it pushes the bike into its stroke. Now, I think this is a really cool idea, and you often see it with e-bikers. They'll mention about how much better small and medium bump sensitivity they get, and it's down to this basic principle, the bike having a weight to work against. We actually saw it when Geometron were experimenting on the World Cup circuit. They actually bolted some lead to the bikes that you may have seen. But no, it's really cool. I'd love to give it a try. And if it can improve your suspension, it's definitely worth exploring. Yeah, so those adjustable offset forks, look while well, the crowns look pretty incredible. They're not available yet. They're still being laser etched but keep an eye on their website, which we'll link to because yeah, they'll be out very, very, very soon. Yeah, definitely some interesting tech for those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Chris Porter been leading the way for tech for a long time and actually he's behind um, Martin's tandem, the random tandem. Yeah. So um, pretty special guys over there. Which I actually managed to swig a leg over. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Absolutely <laughs> terrifying. It's not what you think, is it? No, it yeah, really it's isn't. It's worse. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is that, the dropper doesn't work. No. More, more firepower, Captain! Like, ah! <laughs> We're gonna go down this bank here. Oh, you're joking! No, 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 Doddy, don't, don't, Doddy, don't, don't do it, man. Yeah, we're going down this bank. No, I'm scared. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, I did the stopping. I forgot I was on the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, there we go. There's another weekly GMBN Tech Show in the bag. If you've got any questions or any comments, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, get them down there below us. Uh, for another great video, if you want to see about silencing your cables and your cockpit and internal cables, click down there for Henry's video on that. Yeah, and if you want to see uh, Doddy's really cool bike check, actually, on the old Foes, which is just a sensational looking bike, click down there. And as always, please don't forget to share and subscribe to our channel. Give us a thumbs up if you like the content. Cheers, guys.